Section 6 of Dog Heroes of Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dog Heroes of Many Lands by Sarah Noble Ives. Section 6 Byron, a Dog of Scotland. A short, sharp bark, a long-drawn howl of misery, and then silence. Dr. Ross turned aside into the little coppice that bordered the path along his meadow, for he was returning cross lots from a professional visit in the nearby village. From the depths of the underbrush the sounds were repeated. Something must be in trouble, said the good doctor, as he hurried a little faster bide a bit there he plunged in among the matted vines and shrubs to the spot whence came the cries and stopped suddenly when a big collie appeared in the depths of the tangle byron is it you byron what are you doing here poaching on my preserves as i live i didn't think it of you why what's the matter poor old chap i take that back someone else is the poacher and he's caught you in his trap byron whimpered big fine sheep dog that he was bred to and doing a man's work here he was crying like a baby for sheer pain and his paw the poor paw of him with which he had so unwittingly stepped into the poacher's trap dr ross released it from the cruel teeth that had snapped on it and held it bleeding and broken boned in his hand while he examined it that's a bad paw but we can mend it don't you know byron that even innocent squirrel chasing is wrong when we should be tending our flock byron could not tell the doctor that he too had been cutting cross lots to catch up with his master james burnett who had gone on a hurried errand leaving his sheep in the byre but he looked his innocence and grief at Dr. Ross's misjudgment of him. There now, Byron, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. You're a good dog, and the best of you must have a failing or two, or you would be all angels and not dogs. There's my kerchief, tied to stop the bleeding. Can you limp along a bit to my office? You're too big to carry. We'll soon put you to rights. Dr. Ross led the way out of the coppice, across the meadow and into his own garden, thence to the little latticed doorway that opened into his private office. Byron hobbled dolefully after him. As he opened the door, the doctor beheld James Burnett, his uncle's head shepherd and Byron's master, waiting for him in the cheery little office, his hands spread before the blaze that danced on the hearth for it was autumn and chilly. Good morning. What brings you here, James? I came, doctor, to get a bit of physic for the lassie. She's ailing. Byron, he looked sharply at the dog. What's wrong with you? Byron came shambling in on three legs and sat before his master, holding up his bandaged paw as his answer. What have you done with yourself, man, that you are seeking the doctor? caught his foot in a trap james evidently there are poachers about i bade him bide at home this morning but he's always wanting to be with me and i'm thinking he came after me by the burn and over your meadow byron do you not know the wrong of disobedience it was the prompting of affection james i i know and there is no better dog with the sheep in all scotland well he must take his punishment with the rest of them that gang their ain gait. Wait till I dress the paw, James, and he can go back with you, unless Maggie is very ill. It's not so serious, doctor. Just a bit pain in the stomach. I'll bide. With swift, skilled fingers, Dr. Ross cleaned Byron's paw, set the bone, and bound it in splints, the dog, meanwhile, uttering no complaint gritting his teeth manfully to the pain, confident in the doctor's skill, and sure that what was happening 
was for the best. He won't be much use to you on the moors for a couple of weeks, James, but he's worth coddling, and he'll come out all right. He took the dressing like a stoic. He can abide with Elsie and wee Maggie till he has four legs to run with. You're a good friend to him and to us all. He hesitated. I have a bit cough myself, doctor, that's sticking by me. Could you give me a dose for that? Indeed I can. Here you are. Coddle yourself a bit, James, and wrap up warmly. A cough like that is a bad thing to start with in a winter season. The shepherd started home with his dog on three legs at his side. For two or three days, James came with Byron for the dressing of the paw. After that, Byron came alone, and a great friendship sprang out of the big heart of the doctor and the gratitude of the dog. In as short a time as possible, with good blood, a fine constitution, and proper care, Byron's paw was as good as the best. But even after he had gone back to his work with the flock, he made visits to the doctor, coming after the day's work was over and he was released from duty. As for James Burnett, when the first blasts of winter struck the rolling hills around Moffatdale, his cough developed into something worse, and before Michaelmas came, Vices, in its worst form, had left Elsie without a husband and Maggie and Willie without a father. As Dr. Ross sat by the sick man in his last hours, James opened his eyes. Will you bend a bit nigher, doctor? The doctor leaned above the bed, and his strong, warm grip closed on James's wasted hand. You have been very good to me and mine, doctor, and I would like to give Byron to you. He loves you now almost more than any other. Will you call him here? Byron lay on the doorstone where he was wooing the thin rays of wintry sunshine. At the doctor's call, he entered the sick room, with all the solemnity of the occasion glooming in his eyes. James laid his hand on the dog's furry cheek. Byron, you must always bide with Dr. Ross. I'm going away, and I cannot come back to you. Elsie, woman! A cough interrupted him, then a violent spasm of choking, a sudden gush of blood from the lungs. Then there was no sound but Elsie's tearless sobs and the childish weeping of little Maggie, who did not understand but cried because her mother did. After the funeral, Byron went home with Dr. Ross. For many days he was like a lost child and would run off to his old flock whenever a fit of homesickness seized him. But there was a new shepherd there and a new dog, and he soon grew to understand that his old master was gone and that he was to abide with the doctor, as James had willed. It was a much more comfortable life, if not quite so much to Byron's liking. He would follow Dr. Ross on his rounds, waiting quietly by the horse during calls. The neighbors soon grew to know that a sight of Byron heralded the approach of Dr. Ross. He chose the stable at night for his sleeping quarters, for he was not accustomed to luxury, and his own warm coat had always been shelter enough even in the wild weather on the moors. As the months went on, he grew quite happy and contented. If the old life among the heather called to him now and then, with too sweet insistence, he would disappear, perhaps, for a day. But sunset found him always back at the latticed door of Dr. Ross's office. Evenings he would spend with his head between his paws, gazing at the study fire, wrapping the floor with his tail when the back log fell or when Dr. Ross stirred up the embers. On a July day of the year after James's death, there was a fair in progress at Moffat, and the doctor walked over to see the merrymaking. Byron, capering and delighted, ran hither and thither, filled with the joy of the day. Once he digressed, like the gentleman he was, to rescue the underdog in an unequal fight, 
Then he was off again, as if rescuing the oppressed were an everyday matter to him. The fair itself was like all fairs. After the races and the games were over, the doctor did not remain longer than to greet a few friends. He was past the days of giddy-go-rounds and sweetmeats. But while he gained nothing in particular at the fair, he did lose something, the key to his laboratory. He discovered the loss on his return. In vain he tried his other keys in the lock. Nothing would fit. Then he bethought himself. Byron, he said to the dog who waited to follow him in. Byron, I have lost my key. Can you find it? A key like this one, Byron. He showed him one similar to the key lost. Byron, with an expectant quiver, smelled the key. Then, with a look of keen intelligence at his master, he trotted off by the road they had taken to the fair. Nose to the trail he went. Arriving at the fairgrounds, he did what a human detective might have done. He seemed in his mind to divide the whole field into squares. The crowd had thinned out so that he was not interrupted, but there were many interested spectators. Square by square he took the ground, running in circles from the outside, always closing in on the center. Over and over he did this. At last those interested enough to watch him at his maneuvers saw him, as he was working near the grandstand, pick up something in his mouth, after which there was no more hunting. He turned tail and left the fairgrounds, running swiftly all the way back to Moffatdale. Three hours after he had been sent on his quest, he reappeared at Dr. Ross's home. He carried in his mouth the lost key. There came a winter, a bitter time it was, when the snows came early and lay deep and long on hill and valley. Byron's old flock had been grazing on the outlying hills of the district, and when the first flakes fell out of the leaden sky, they were far from home. Then, all at once, the temperature dropped amazingly, and an icy norther swooped down upon them. The air was filled with a mass of fine, stinging flakelets that bit in even through homespun and coats of wool, blinding the eyes of sheep, dog, and man. Through the smother and the howling fury, the shepherd of Moffatdale and his dog worked like heroes while there was yet a chance for life. Across the moor the swirling snow devils danced their spiral reels, whirling up and up to fall at last in ever-deepening drifts. The sheep, bleeding with fear and the awful cold, suffered themselves to be gathered from ridge and gully, and so clustered, running and stumbling and ever running to keep from freezing, they were painfully driven homeward. As the dusk fell, hardly making the world darker than had the storm, in at the byer gates and out of the fangs of the gale swept the huddle of sheep, dog, and master, safe safe yes but not all james burnett's successor counted opened his tired eyes and counted again the number was sixty-five short where in that inferno that shrieked and clamored outside were the sixty-five lost for sure the shepherd started from sheer force of his duty toward the door but returned as the blast nearly knocked him over, thankful that at least a goodly number were safe. It meant death to try to find the others, even had he not already been exhausted. He sat dejectedly with his head in his despairing hands while the storm beat vainly upon the byer. Morning and a white world. Walls and hedges there were none, Bramble, wild rose, and prickly whin bushes, gone. Where were once black tarns, lay white floors. The dimpling, cup-like little valleys were lost. 
the only colors were the gold of the clearing sky the blue of the smoke threads that stole heavenward from the buried cottages and here and there along the burn a bit of slow moving brown that had had the courage to break through the walls of its white prison three shepherds good and true with their dogs started out in the early light to find the missing sheep three shepherds hunted through a weary day and dragged themselves home at night not having seen the tales even of the lost they sat in weary despair over their supper of steaming porridge in the kitchen at moffatdale and then and only then did one of them say byron he'd be the lad to find them there's ain sheep and he kens all the crannies in the hills thus it was that early the next morning the crestfallen shepherd of moffatdale knocked at dr ross's door and told the tale of the disaster byron called his master byron came eagerly there was a new vibration in dr ross's voice it awakened old thrills that had lain sleeping through the comfortable years he looked at the shepherd and in his heavy homespun he smelled the old familiar odor of flock and byer byron said the doctor there are sixty-five sheep missing find them sixty-five sheep he repeated this slowly and clearly the dog hung on his words for an instant then lifting his head to the wind as if he knew already what humans could not he gave a quick short bark and was gone alone leaping plunging smothering in the drifts then up and off again he worked his way across the meadow over the sleeping burn the hill beyond and a wind-swept upland then he bounded over the ridge and was out of sight and the sheep oh he found them of a surety never doubt that in a dry tarn hole he found them where they had sought shelter from the storm there the snow had swirled and settled over them in a great drift until they were huddled safe and snug in a room of snow hollowed out by the warmth of their bodies and covered with a roof of white flakes three feet thick no eskimo was ever safer in his steaming igloo than the little band of strays but it was close quarters and two days without food had destroyed any sense of thankfulness they might have had at the outset into the little valley came byron sniffing and plunging and shaking the snow from his dark coat and here there came to him the sheep smell who should know it better byron barked and down at the bottom of the clue there sounded an answering bah down the rocks he felt his way going cautiously as he neared the hole lest he should be buried in the drift along a granite seam where the scent came strongest he began to dig with his paws the snow flew as he tunneled in faster and faster he dug until at last he broke through into the strange shelter they were all there and there were many of them who had known byron of old they obeyed his voice and started for the tunneled opening with their old herder at their heels out they went and over moor and fen and crag they traveled the white world at byron's bidding it was eight of the morning when he started at three of the afternoon the shepherd of moffatdale saw the last remnant of his flock silhouetted on a nearby hill crest into the byre they came sixty-five not one missing with a pause at the door of the cottage where elsie still lived a bark of greeting to her and the lad and the lassie and a look of piteous pleading for the old master who was away he was off once more back to dr ross his duty done once again in that bleak winter came a storm that raged like a sea on a rock-bound coast the wind 
blowing sixty miles an hour, drove the snow in clouds of fine dust that settled at last from sheer weight into huge drifts. It was a storm overtopping any storm known for years. Through it, at nightfall, Dr. Ross drove his gasping horse, for he had been caught while on his rounds. Under the buggy plodded Byron, weary, too, with a long battle. Giving the reins to the stable boy, the doctor entered the cozy, fire-lit hall and was met by his housekeeper. It's a pity now, doctor, to tell you this, but Elsie Burnett is much worse, and they do say it may be scarlet fever. Willie has come over through the storm, and he's very anxious. You'll find him waiting in the kitchen. Dr. Ross looked regretfully at the leaping fire and through the doorway of the dining room where he caught a vision of white linen and shining silver. Then he braced himself to the task that a country doctor must so often meet. I had better go. I might send medicines, but it's unsafe to let Willie go back alone, and Elsie may need my personal attention. I'll just take a bite and some hot tea. Byron, are you good for another journey? I'll need you to shepherd me if I get lost. Will you go to James Burnett's cottage with Willie and me? Would he? He needed no further asking. He rose from the hearth where his long, wet hair was already wreathed with steam, shook himself, and stood with uplifted head, ready. The doctor made a hurried meal, eating it in morsels, even while he made his preparations for departure. I'll tie the medicines to you, Byron. If I fail to make it, you may be able to win through to the cottage with Willie. You are both young. Two miles, whew, and my horse is exhausted. We must fetch it on foot by the shortcut. Bundled to the eyes in coats and mufflers, topped with a shepherd's plaid, Dr. Ross stepped into the kitchen to find that Willie, in his anxiety, had gone on ahead. Then he turned with Byron and went out into the night and storm. There was no path. The snow in ever-moving masses was absolutely trackless. Even their own footprints, as they stepped out of them, disappeared as if by magic. There was nothing to be seen only a gray, writhing vortex with the doctor's lantern for its center. Letting the dog lead the way, he went on with a prayer to the god of battles for strength. Elsie Burnett's cottage lay at the head of a long gulch that ran between two hills. In fine weather, one might climb with safety, but on a night like this there was much to fear. At the base of the hill, Dr. Ross faced the real danger that rose before him. Down through the gulch, the gale came whistling a death song. It was as if the four winds of heaven had poured into that steep and narrow pass. Up and down the rocky sides of it, they shrieked and hammered, clutching and throttling each other. Dr. Ross felt for the rocky wall at his left and clinging to any stray bush or escarpment, he stumbled along with his bobbing lantern. Once he staggered and fell, and the lantern, immersed in the snow, went out. Dragging himself to an angle in the rocks where he could relight it, he looked around, fearful that Byron would be out of sight. No, there he stood, looming up big and black against the weird gray ghosts of the gulch, waiting the doctor's good pleasure. On they went, two moving shadows, a light and a ring of soft gold. Down the ravine thundered the tempest, and up they moved against it. Now they reached the second height and the beginning of a path on the edge of the steepest place where they must round the hill. Here the wind hurled the doctor back, and he was obliged to move slowly and between the gusts, clinging desperately to the rock 
and edging along as he dared. Fortunate it was that the wind blew from the chasm, thus pinning him, as it were, to the ledge, instead of blowing him away. Suddenly, as he was rounding the bend, Byron stopped, ears erect, listening, quivering, as if something out there in the void had uttered a warning. The doctor listened, but the booming of the great guns of the tempest drowned every other noise. Byron calmed down again and proceeded slowly, still looking and listening. He showed no excitement now, but a steady self-possession. Now he stopped a second time, looked over the edge of the clue, then back at Dr. Ross as if he were solving a problem. Then, with a quick step, he turned back to his master and pressed against him gently, as if he were a sheep to be herded to safety. As plainly as words his gestures said, Go back, master, danger ahead. For force, the doctor began retracing his steps, obeying the superior instincts of the animal. Then, remembering his errand of mercy, he turned once more to his task. We've got to reach the cottage, Byron. Elsie may die. For answer, Byron gave a low growl, then a more savage one, as if he intended positively to dispute the passage. All right, Byron, lead the way. I'll follow. You know your business. Herd me, drive me, lead me. I'm yours to command. Seeing the doctor's docility, Byron started back around the curve. Into a side path he led the way, and up a longer but less dangerous track. So, by a detour, they came safely at last to the cottage. Dropping his spent body into a chair, the doctor sat for a moment until his breath came back and his heart began to beat to an easier measure. Then he looked up and before speaking took in the situation. Little Maggie was alone with her mother. Willie had not returned. Somewhere out in that storm he was lost, struggling, perhaps dying, or dead. Moments were precious now, and the mother in her critical state must not be alarmed. Swiftly the doctor untied the package of medicine from Byron's neck and ministered with his own hands and the little lassie's help to Elsie's immediate wants. The woman groaned, opened her eyes, looked around the room, and then rested her fever-stricken eyes on Dr. Ross. Where's Willie? Did not he come with you? He's all right, Elsie. He'll follow later. I came on ahead. There now, Maggie, lass. Listen carefully and remember, this is to be given to your mother every hour, and this, as I have written on the bottle, when the fever goes down. Now, Mrs. Burnett, you'll be feeling fine in the morning, and I must get back. I may keep Willie all night if the storm gets worse. Now, good night and a good sleep. Good night, and God be with you. God be with you, the words drifted out into the tempest as the doctor stepped over the cottage threshold and shut the door on the warmth and light. He had need of that prayer. Stooping, he spoke in the ear of the dog who had followed him. Low, he whispered, so that the words should not reach anxious ears in the cottage. Byron... Willie's in the gulch. We must find him. The dog gave a little whine, as if to say, I understand, and was off so rapidly that Dr. Ross had difficulty in keeping sight of him. Not by the road they had come did Byron travel. Instead, he plunged into a one-time path that led directly down into the gulch. This was old ground to him, and once his home, and Willie was one of his old family. He knew every inch of the place, 
and he knew things too that dr ross did not know down he went here in the lower part of the gulch the wind did not reach with such fury and a more rapid progress was possible all at once byron stopped dead in his tracks and as the doctor caught up with him he began pawing at the snow looking up along the face of the sheer rock to which he clung dr ross recognized above him the path around the bend back from which byron had herded him just a glimpse he had and then the smoke-like rolling of the snow eddies closed around him again hiding all that was not within the golden ring around the lantern byron was digging now digging with all his remaining strength he scraped frantically at the snow as if something was hidden there in a half stupor caused by the cold and exhaustion the doctor watched was that a bit of homespun that dark fragment in the snow that byron's work had disclosed down went the doctor on his knees and he too worked the snow flew faster yes it was willie willie who had fallen over the rock just in the place from which byron had warned the doctor all weariness was gone now man and dog worked for the life of the boy for he was not dead the snow beneath had softened the shock of his drop and the snow that fell over him had kept him from freezing he had been stunned however and had he been left to himself he must have perished but byron had found him and now dr ross with the lad in his arms made his last terrific struggle with the storm then in the glow of elsie's hearth fire willie's eyes opened and his lips formed the words where am i elsie was sleeping so soundly that she never knew until the next morning of the night's adventure but she tells it proudly now and in her eyes grows the light of adoration as she speaks of the good doctor and that shaggy embodiment of the stuff that makes heroes byron of moffatdale end of section six recording by sue anderson